My name is Cassandra Mensing. I've been with the program since it started in 2009. I was a volunteer um, and I am now the manager. I started managing the program back in 2011. Okay, <clears throat> so what you're here for is why do we want to save bottle babies? Well, first of all, bottle babies um, make up the most amount of kittens that are euthanized in shelters. It's one of the statistics that people kind of overlook. Um, we saved 16, roughly 1,600 kittens last season. <clears throat> when we first started, we only did 250. So as you can tell, as your program gets bigger and bigger, you'll be able to save more lives, which has a bigger impact on the no-kill uh, commitment in your community. Um, and plus, of course, they're so cute there. So, uh, Which one should we rescue? Um, this is the thing when you're first starting out. Um, your resources are going to be small. You're going to have a small uh, base of volunteers. You might not even have a, a, a very big area to house them in. So you have to kind of be picky at the very beginning of which ones you can move through your program pretty rapidly. Um, the best way to do it is, um, I hate to say it, but um, breeds. Uh, those Siamese kittens seem to get adopted a little bit faster than the little black ones. So when you first start off, you've got to see which ones you can get through your program more rapidly, so that way you have a bigger impact, that way you can save more. Um, when you first start out, uh, you probably want to stay away from the sick kittens. Those are the ones that are going um, to add up to be kind of expensive. Um, when you start getting into medicines and things like that, it's going to be a little, um, like I said, it's going to be a little bit more expensive on your budget. Um, you need to pull the healthy ones because those are the ones that are going to get euthanized too, right, just because of their age. Um, after you do that, you want to make sure um, the gruel sage is when they're a little bit older. You want to pull those guys because they're easier to find foster for. Um, also, they're a little bit more hardy, um, so that way when you pull in a, you know, a 400 gram kitten is easier to take care of than a little 100 gram kitten. Um, those are usually your bottle babies. Um, I also would just recommend that if you do decide to do pull the bottle babies, that maybe you reach out to the three week old age group um, because they still have, um, you know, the interest that volunteers want. Volunteers want to come and feed, bottle, give bottles to kittens. Um, but the three week olds are on that cusp, so they can, are just getting ready to transition to gruel. So the three-week um, mark is where they're still taking a little bit of bottle, but they have some weight on them, so they're not as fragile as the little tiny newborns. Um, the pregnant mom program is huge with our, um, with our program. It's easier to place in foster when you have someone there making the milk for you. Um, <clears throat> fosters who work eight-hour days are able to take in these, um, so that way you have a bigger foster pool. Plus, it's easy for us to put um, orphans on nursing moms. Um, of course, we do all the tests and everything. The, the nursing mom has to be healthy. She has to be FIV negative because it will pass through the breast milk to the kittens. Um, and of course, the singletons that you want to put on her has to be healthy as, as well. Um, when you do introduce the um, pregnant and nursing mom program, um, we go ahead and tell our fosters straight up that you will be getting kittens added to your mom. A lot of people will take a mom and it only has three kittens on them and they're like, oh no, I'm good. I only want my three kittens. Um, we let them know right up front that if you are going to foster, you are going to have uh, singletons added. That's the whole reason why we're doing this program. Um, we do, when we get the kittens in, we wait maybe 48 hours to make sure that they don't come down with any sickness or anything, um, just from the exposure of going into the shelter. Um, and once that happens um, and they are clear, then we'll add them to mom. And you'll know right away if mom does not want the baby. She will hiss, swat. She will definitely let you know, I do not want that baby. Oh, and just one more thing. With the nursing moms, you will still have to make sure you're weighing the babies to make sure they are gaining. Um, like everything else, there's always, there could be a little runt in the group, something like that that's getting pushed away. So weighing is, the, uh, monitoring their weights is very important. And if they start, if you see a decline in weight with one of them, that's when you would want to supplement. And just know from the start, you can't save them all. I mean, especially when you're starting your program out, you can be, you know, just say Houston, for example, or something like that, where the, the, the kill rate is just unbelievable. Um, there's 2,000 kittens that you need to be saved. You want to save them all, but unfortunately you can't. You can't do it because 
You want the ones that you pull into your program, you have to make sure you have enough feeders. You ethically cannot pull kittens into an area and then let them starve. That's just not what we're about. Um, the same thing with um, disease. You know, uh, when you start getting a bunch of animals in the same area, it turns into a shelter environment, which means you know, um, URI can spread around, things like that. The more animals you have in a confined space, the the more chances you are for sickness to spread. So just know from the start, you can't save them all. Start small, that way you don't get overwhelmed. Um, and that way the ones that you do save have a better life, have a better outcome. Where can you keep babies? Well, we can keep them anywhere. Um, if you see here this little trailer that's in the picture, we started off, this is Billy's bottled baby trailer. That's the little black cat's name, Billy, on there. We only had half of that. <clears throat> this trailer had zero running water. We had to bring jugs of water to our volunteer shifts. Zero trash, you know, there's no dumpster, so we took the trash home with us. Uh, laundry, so we took the laundry home with us, bring it back between our volunteer shifts. Um, no restroom, we had to beg and plead to the people down the street that they would let us go, or we would definitely go before our, our shifts. Um, uh, it was kind of a, a lone feeling at the very beginning. There was only a handful of us. Um, when I first started is when it was getting, becoming open. We were just looking for um, chairs, you know, tables, things like that to put inside. And um, they basically just took a bottle in your hand and said, let's feed. That's how it started. Um, there was a need. We just jumped in. And then as the seasons came, uh, came about, we kind of perfected everything. As you can see, we moved from the half the trailer to our man check location, which was our own private leasing. We leased the, the property. Um, it's sad, it got torn down for condos now. But um, <clears throat> then we moved into our Town Lake facility, which is our biggest facility yet. We went from one room to the nursery. Those who went to the wet lab saw that it's kind of a big size. We have three rooms in that room. What do you need to start? Okay, at the very beginning, yeah, you just need a plan. You just need, okay, where are we going to have it? Once you have established that, then um, you need to get people in there to feed them. Uh, everything else is tweaking throughout the, the season. So, yeah, so you need, um, <clears throat> of course, you need a medical team. Um, when you're first opening and starting, your, most of your kittens are going to be healthy. So um, are you going to strive to get the ones that seem healthy? Um, but of course, once you get them, you never know. They can catch little colds, things like that, once they enter the, the shelter. Um, and so you need to be close to a medical team because um, you'll need to test all your kittens for FELV. That's extremely important. I know um, some vets will tell you that they're too young to test, but that is incorrect. You can test them, and they can, will test positive if they are FELV positive. Uh, if you're using the whole blood tests, we recommend that you serum test them instead um, if it comes up positive because sometimes it will be a false positive from the antibodies from uh, mama. So just make sure you always do a serum test before you deem them FELV positive. Um, water, like I said, you'll need water, but it doesn't have to come from a pipe. You can bring them in in like little jugs. Uh, volunteers, laundry, that's one good thing too. If um, some people are weary about actually feeding the little tiny kittens. You can have them come and do your laundry for you. A trash removal, that's always a fun one. No one really likes doing that, but um, we had to do it. It was a need, and so um, there's ways around it if you don't have a dumpster nearby. You will have to have a refrigerator. Our refrigerator in the trailer um, would freeze over every, like, every other week, so we we're constantly defrosting it, but it worked. It helped you know, at the very beginning. Microwave for the bottles, uh, of course, volunteers, you have to have them to feed the kittens before you can pull them. And of course, fosters, once you know your five cages are filled up, you can't take any more kittens in, right? So you need to get them out, you need to get them into foster, that way you can start saving more lives. And of course, you need kittens. So when your program gets bigger, it's, of course, it's gonna be better if you're in a convenient location, because once those kittens um, you get more kittens, you want more volunteers to come feed, right? So you want to have an, a, an, a central location that's friendly for volunteers to come help. Um, that's one thing about this program you're going to learn. The, I'm going to repeat over and over and over. It just has to be volunteer friendly. Like everything has to be volunteer friendly. Um, information, you can't have too much information. Um, plaster those walls with information, things like that. So 
Um, plumbing, okay, now, which currently in our nursery now, we only have one room that has a sink. The other two rooms has no sinks, but we have a kitchen down the hall. We have protocols telling them how to wash their hands in between litters. They still have to do all these things. They just have to do it in a, a more unique way. Um, dishwasher, yeah. We appreciate, we like having the dishwasher. It sanitizes a little bit better, but you don't have to have those things. But once you get bigger, washer and dryer on this on site is going to be a total must um, because you will be going through tons of laundry. Uh, if you think about cleaning a cage every two to three hours, um, every two hours you have that, the bedding that you're putting in the laundry and putting new clean in there. And if you have 50 cages, then that's a lot of laundry, as you can tell just from that. More volunteers. Um, the, way, the way we run our program, if I don't have volunteers to feed, I can't pull kittens. I can't ethically pull kittens into the nursery knowing that they're going way too long without eating. Um, the lack of food, the lower blood sugar always leads to, you know, fading kitten and things like that. And we are here in the business to save them, not to, you know, so. Interns. I love interns. If you guys are anywhere near a college at all, um, the medical experience they can learn, it's such a unique area. Uh, you don't really get experience with neonatals. Um, at vet offices and things like that. So if you have some med students, human med, med students, anyone, um, they can come in and, and intern with you and they can learn how to do injections and things like that. Um, plus just general uh, needle natal care. Um, we were shocked last year when we put out a plea just to our volunteers for interns and we had an, a, an abundance of people replying. Um, so we did some interviews and we wind, wound up with like four interns last season. It was a really big help. Um, and of course, more kittens. More kittens, more structure. So we have now, last season we started the all in, all out system. It has been a lifesaver for us. Um, that way I, I'm sure, the, the ones that went to my wet lab yesterday, we did have Pan Luke happen in our nursery. It does happen, they come to us, you know. How our um, program works is um, our animal shelter contacts us and let us know when people drop off kittens. Um, and then we have like a two hour window to go pick them up um, or they feel like, you know, they're going to have to euthanize them. Um, and so during that two hours, they don't really have that much time to, um, you know, look at them, assess them, that kind of thing. So sometimes they come straight to us and we don't know what's going on until we get them. And then they wind up having Pan Luke. Um, the all in all out is basically each room, you see room A, B, C, they're like their own separate nursery. That way if room A has a kitten that comes down with Pan Luke, we can shut that room down and still work out of room B and C. Now what that means is everything that's in room A stays in room A. You do not take any laundry, you do not take any snuggle safe discs, you do not take a kitten, you take nothing out of room A and put it in room B or C. Same thing goes with room B and room C. This includes volunteers. Volunteers do not go room to room. The only people that are allowed to do that are our medical staff uh, and, and medical interns and that is because they are trained they're not in there holding the kittens and feeding them and doing that. They're going in and like basically giving them a poke or something like that. So we're not as having them crawling all over us, things like that. And plus we also know our protocols, you know, we spray ourselves down with trifecta and things like that as well. But if there's one thing you need to ingrain in your volunteers if you're going to use this system that you can't, if you start taking things from other rooms, then you just ruin the whole, the whole thing. Because now I can't say that room A truly is quarantined because the items from there went to another room. Who knows if that item was used with that kitten or not? We don't know. Um, so uh, we also have a, it's not pictured here, an overflow area. Those who did the tour got to see. Um, it's great to have cages in a different area so that way when FELV comes up, things like that, you're not actually putting them in the general population with the rest of the kittens. Um, the reason why we separate FELV from the rest of the group is because when you have, let's see, like 30 different volunteers working a day, those are different hands going in different cages. And some of them might have just finished their shadowing yesterday. This is their first day out there. And then guess what? They're feeding this kitten. It just happens to be whatever time they show up. 
So um, we want to make sure that the FELV kittens do not accidentally get put in extra cages, things like that. So just make sure you have a little area. We have five cages um, that we call in our overflow room that you can you know, put kittens in for an emergency situations and then constantly work on foster. And of course, um, policies and procedures. Now that you're big, if you had like five people before, communication was easy. You can just literally do a group text to everyone. Um, or you can just, hey, don't wash your hands from now on, okay? We're changing this from wearing gloves, washing hands. And it's easy, people can learn it and it sticks. When you get 100 people volunteering for you, you gotta be a little bit more clear. You gotta have your information um, just to the T. So that way there's no questions, there's no room for mm, second guessing. Does she really mean this or does she mean that? Make it very clear for volunteers. Um, they appreciate that. They wanna know what they can do to help. Give them the information. And of course, training. Um, some of the things is when you are doing this program, it is a 24 hour program. Our nursery is open from 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. I leave. I'm not there 24 hours a day. My assistant's not there as well. So you're going to have to give them the tools so they can succeed and be able to feed while you're not there, knowing that they're going to go ahead and, and do the protocols. They're going to follow the rules um, because they know how important it is to save these kittens' lives and how by putting your hands in cages and touching different kittens is spreading disease and therefore some of these little um, kittens do not have the immune systems and they can't handle it. So you want to make sure that you strive how important it is. You'll need more supplies. Oh my goodness, supplies, supplies, supplies. So um, this is just kind of an example of the supplies you'll need. Those little cardboard litter boxes are a saint. Um, you can go to any Petco, PetSmart, whatever, and they'll just give them to you. Um, they're really small, so little feet can climb in, and um, once they get a little dirty, you can toss them in the trash and no cleaning. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a fan of scrubbing litter boxes, and this is the easiest way to keep that. And plus, contagion, if you have some kittens that are having tummy troubles, um, the best way to, um, for them not to reinfect themselves is if you have the cardboard box and you just throw it away so that way there's no fecal matter just laying around for them to keep walking through that kind of thing and, and, and keep spreading the, the parasites. Um, organization, once you have, of course, all your supplies, you want to make sure they're organized so you can get them. Um, one of the most important things for volunteers is to have one spot for all your storage stuff. Do not have five different areas. Oh, where's paper towels? Oh, well, it could be here. And then after you look there, okay, well, maybe it's here, and then maybe it's there. You're having this feeder spend like 30 minutes trying to find paper towels before they can even feed. They could already fed a kitten by then, right? So you want to make sure you only have one general area where all your supplies are, so that way they can easily, hey, you need paper towels? Go to your storage room. If it's not in the storage room, okay, we need to plea and get more donations. It's as simple as that. Um, Create a wish list for donations as well. There's a lot of people that come to our website. There's a lot of co corporate people out there. They're like, hey, we want to sponsor you guys. What can we do for you? And I mean, if you're not going to ask, you're not going to get, right? So go ahead and make a wonderful wish list, anything you ever wanted, and you never know. Somebody might give that to you. Basic care. Heat source is the number one thing. Um, it's very, very important for kittens. As you know, kittens cannot maintain their own body heat. Um, mama cats are, what, around 102, 103 degrees, so um, we want to make sure that you guys know that your body heat is not enough to take care of a kitten. So when you see people putting kittens in their bras and things like that, you're not doing anything. You need to have a proper heat source for them to keep them warm. Um, snuggle safe discs are great. They're easy because they fit in carriers, they fit in hamster cages, they fit in, it depends on what you know, whatever type of area you want to put kittens in, they work wonderful. Um, they also stay heated for wrong, uh, a long time, eight hours. Um, of course, after you use them repeatedly season after season, they won't last as long, but um, we've had great success with them. Um, a feeding schedule, of course, bowed babies get fed every two to three hours, and then um, girl babies will be every four to five. Um, just, we have, Make sure our kittens, uh, our, our volunteers know that. Of course, the little newborns will be every two. Those three week old kittens, you can go a little bit longer at about three hours. So that's another benefit for um, doing the older bottle babies when you're first starting out is because they don't have to be feed, fed as often. 
Um, so that way, if you're still working on getting your volunteers together, um, you won't have to worry about that every regiment two hour uh, feeding. Way feed way. Okay, this is the most important thing as well because when you're feeding a kitten and you're not weighing them, you don't know how much is actually getting in their tummy. The milk can spill on their, their fur. Um, you put a plate of gruel down and they walk all through it. Half of it's on them instead of in their bellies. So you can't sit there and say, oh, they're, they've had enough and put them back away. Um, you weigh an empty belly. You uh, find out how much 5% of their body weight is. Uh, in our nursery, we have a cheat sheet for everyone hanging up in every room. So it has all the math done for you. So literally you just look, my kitten's 450 grams. This is how much that needs to weigh at the end and that's it. We don't ask them to count how many syringes because that's actually not gonna work. So way feed way is our mantra. We say that all the time in the nursery. We dilute our KMR. Um, we actually learned how to do this from the um, Wildlife Center and here in Texas and it, we, with their baby squirrels, they noticed that they were getting diarrhea really easily. And it was from um, the, the milk. It's a little too strong for them. Their little bellies aren't used to it. So what they decided to do is we are diluting it. So for the first four feedings, it's going to be eight to one. That way you're generally introducing it to the kittens. Then the next is going to be four to one and then two to one. So within like a 24 hour period, they should be already on two to one. So they're not missing out on the nutrients that you're thinking, oh my gosh, you're watering it down. They're not getting enough nutrients. They are, it's only for a short period of time. If you're feeding them every two hours, um, this is gonna go by pretty fast, but it's just kind of gently um, introducing it to their systems. Wet food, um, you know, just make sure you keep the same brand, um, especially when you're doing volunteers. I know it's hard, especially if you're starting out and you're just getting donations. Um, just ask for one certain brand to be donated. Um, if you start mixing and matching different things, you're gonna first of all get diarrhea because you, the kittens from food change, that will happen as well. Um, also, it's hard for volunteers because what if somebody donates a senior diabetic cat wet food or something like that, right? It's just in a can and if everyone's just used to grabbing cans and feeding them, then they're feeding kittens senior food or low calorie food or things like that and we don't want that. So you wanna make sure you just pick a brand. To, uh, the best way to do it, we have someone sponsoring ours so we have no choice in the matter, we just get what we get. But if you get to choose your own brand. Um, just make sure it's um, friendly for the fosters too because once they leave your program, they're gonna go to a foster home and you wanna keep that food the same. Um, if they do come to you and say, hey, I wanna change to a different food, just explain to them that they need to slowly introduce it, so mix it in with what they're already using. Uh, when to feed kibble, kibble, kibble. Okay, so we introduce that to them immediately. Um, as soon as they transition to gruel, we have kibble right there in their cage. Um, kittens are curious creatures. They will eventually step in that bowl. They will eventually spill that bowl and taste it and realize that it's really yummy. Um, I, uh, Royal Canaan kibble, baby cat, the mother cat is the best. Um, it's the only thing that we've found that they will gobble up little tiny pieces too, so it's easy for little mouths. It is a little expensive, um, but I think they have a um, program for rescues now that where you can get it discounted. And instead of getting the small little three pound bags, you can get like a really big bag of it. And it's only through them though, you can't find that on the shelves. But once again, you wanna make sure that your kibbles uh, accessible for the fosters. Uh, you don't want them having to order it online. Um, if they happen to run out of it, they should be able to run to the store really quick and get it. So that way um, the kittens don't go hungry. Meds, of course, they all, everyone, no matter how well your sanitation protocols are, things like that, they are going to get sick and you will have to provide medicine and you'll need a team to administer them. Um, if you're the only manager there and you're only working an eight hour day, it's gonna be hard to keep up with all the meds. So like I said, if you can get some interns, um, volunteer interns to come in and help you, it's gonna be a lifesaver. And then when to transition from BB program to CAP program, um, with our program what we do is um, once they hit six weeks of age, usually their first vaccines is when they're over to the CAP program. By that time they should be eating on their own, playing and won't need to be um, for us to monitor them or, or force feed them anymore. Protocols, policies, and procedures. Um, feeders have to know what they're doing. You want them to help you um, and for them to be able to do the job, you know, 
efficiently and get all these kittens fed on time, um, you have to make sure their training is, is great. When we first started, we didn't have a training. Like I said, we walked in, they gave us a bottle and we fed them. Um, after that first year, um, the very next year, I actually was the training um, coordinator because I said, we need to train these people. We need to tell them exactly what they're doing because what's happening is somebody's watching me and I'm brand new. I have not done this yet. And I tell them the wrong information. Well, then somebody watches that person and that wrong information gets passed on. And then all of a sudden you have a team of 10 people who everyone's doing their own thing. So training should be very um, precise. You should definitely just tell them all the information that they need to do um, and I mean, I guess sometimes you can give a little bit of like, we do some meetings where people can, we want the volunteers to be able to voice what they want to do, things like that. But just make sure that when they do that, they go through management. They just don't do it on their own. You'll get some people that have a great idea and they want to do something. And then all of a sudden they don't realize the reason why we don't do those things. So just make sure if you have volunteers that they do go through the proper uh, communication channels before they start doing anything. Because like I said, if one person sees it, it will spread. Everyone will start doing the wrong thing. Paid feeders is something we introduced um, the season before last. Um, it's because when we are, with our program, volunteers come to us once a week. That's a mandatory commitment. They have to come feed a reoccurring shift once a week for three hours. Um, when you come and feed once a week, you're not as fast as someone who comes and feeds five times a week. So when you get those paid feeders involved, then, then they kind of pick up the slack when volunteers don't feed as fast. You'll have your paid feeders in there, and their sole responsibility is only to feed. Volunteers also have a cleaning uh, sh uh, end of shift chore is what we call it. Um, at the very end of their shift, they need to clean up after themselves. Well, the paid feeders are just there to, to feed. So while they're doing dishes and laundry and that kind of stuff, our paid feeders are in there just going through, trying to make sure all the kittens are fed. Um, you have to make sure the kittens are eating on their, um, are, are gaining weight. That's the one key that will let you know before you hear that sneeze, before you see anything, weight loss is the first thing. Um, that's why you need to make sure that you're checking your med charts and they are gaining weight over a 24 hour period. Um, you'll notice a kitten that lost one, one day. Next day, if they're up again, that's fine. Um, if you see it two days in a row, then you really need to investigate. Get in that cage, look through that litter, listen to their lungs, maybe they aspirated, things like that. You wanna make sure you get on that. Um, weight loss is a, usually is a sign of sickness, um, and you want to make sure that it, you catch it really quick before it gets too bad and they wait too, or lose too much weight. Um, if you have, like I said, a 200-gram kitten and it starts losing 10 grams, that's a lot of weight for a little kitten. Um, individual kitten care sheets, um, those that came to the wet lab got to see what those look like. They're really easy and volunteer friendly. You start at one side of the sheet and you work your way through. Um, it step by step tells you what to do. Um, med charts, those are on the front of every chart. That is for my team to do, um, but it's good to see it there. So that way if a volunteer does see diarrhea in the cage, instead of them calling me and saying, oh, there's diarrhea, they can look at the chart and see, oh, it's already on meds, it's being treated already. So that way it'll cut your phone calls down. Uh, we have sign-in, sign-out sheets for feeders. That way we know who is in the nursery at all times. Um, like I said, I can't be there 24 seven, so that way we know who came in, who did what. If I go into room A and I notice that, oh my gosh, where is all the scales in room A? They moved it to another room. I can look on the sign-in sheet and say, see who fed in room A during that time, and I can reach out to them and remind them of our protocols. Uh, end of the day, uh, email goes out. This is a lifesaver if you have a huge program and you need to reach your foster manager, your rescue manager, your um, interns, things like that, especially you have interns that are working when you're not there, which is the goal. Um, if they come in at 8 a.m. and I don't get there till 11, um, you can tell them on this EOD who are critical, the kittens that they know that they need to go in and look at. Our vets are also on this EOD, so that way if they're looking at it and they're like, hmm, that sounds like this kitten needs A, B, or C, they can see it too without everyone, me emailing everyone personally. There's also a daily spreadsheet we do. Um, we use pet point data man management and I just print a location history out. That helps me balance how many kittens are in the nursery. 
Um, that way I know if they've got moved on or if they're still on. And then also double check and write little things like if they've been um, losing weight for 24 hours or not. Um, so of course, sanitation. We have 409 up here because, yes, there's all sorts of different detergents out there, right? But we just make it easy for volunteers and say 409 is the only thing we use in the nursery. That way if they want to bring in donations, they know to bring in 409. If someone's confused about what to clean the cage with, they know to look for 409. Uh, we use the 409 just for um, organic matter. Um, you spray it for fecal matter, for gruel, things like that that's stuck on the cage that will clean it off easier. It is not a uh, disinfectant, so it's not going to kill anything. It's just there to help you get the fecal matter off. After you do that, you have to use a trifectant or uh, bleach water if it's ringworm. Sorry. Amber alert. Yeah. <laughs> My baby's hungry. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and what we talked about was all in, all out. So once again, if you don't do all in, all out, um, I highly recommend it. Because when we first started, we didn't have this. And it really helped our survival rate. Uh, this past season, it was 89%. The year before that, it was 90% survival rate. Um, and that's with us pulling all age, age ranges, um, everything like that. And that's with you know, 1,600 kittens and 89% survival rate. All in, all out is definitely the way to go. If you can do it, um, just structure it that way. Ringworm protocols I just talked about. Um, we don't have the money to supply gloves all the time. We get them donated, we'll, we'll give them to our volunteers. So if your volunteers are worried about ringworm and you can't afford it, we recommend they bring their own gloves with them. You never know when you're gonna handle a ringworm kitten. The kitten can come into, um, into the nursery with zero signs, or maybe they have it in between our, their toes and we didn't see it, and then all of a sudden, a week later, it's everywhere, right? So people handle them without knowing, so we always tell them, hey, wear gloves if you want to, and that's why our protocols is wash hands after each litter as well, because that way we don't know what they have. They could be healthy, seem healthy now, but later turn to have something else. FIV and FVLV protocols, we don't test for FIV, because it doesn't matter to us. Kittens, if they have FIV, it, it, we'll put them with non-FIV kittens. Um, the only time it matters, like I said, was with the nursing moms. You just wanna make sure that, because um, it can go through the breast milk and you wanna make sure that if it's FIV positive, you're only putting FIV positive kittens on her. Um, isolation area, quarantine procedures for more contagion. So we had Pan Luke last year in one of our rooms. Um, so what we did, we just shut it down. We did not have any more intake going into that room. And then we uh, just had our volunteers, um, we just print out a sheet, hang it on the door, and just be like, whenever the volunteer came in, we'll be like, okay, you're going into this room. This room has had Pan Luke in it. Um, and we tell them, okay, just make sure you keep up with your sanitation protocols. Our protocols are so strict that they're the same if there's pan luke in a room. It's exactly the same. Um, and that's a great example to tell people why we do the all in, all out, and why we're so sticklers about it. Um, and then know your cooties. Yes, uh, just basically know the difference between what really is diarrhea. That's the hardest thing um, we have to show uh, volunteers. Um, you know, sometimes you get that soft serve looking, you know, that's okay, but when you have it, you know, cow patty and, and, and this starts getting a little watery is when you want to make sure that's when you jump on the meds. Uh, key roles. This is a basically how um, to have a functioning program. You'll definitely need a rescue coordinator. You need someone to let you know when there's kittens coming um, or if what, they, you know, what they have, things like that. When you're managing the um, nursery, you have volunteers you're having to take care of. If you're also in the med tech, um, you're all doing all the medicines, you're taking care of them that way. Um, you're not going to be in front of your computer. You're not going to be able to see all those, hey, can you come get these kittens? So you need to have someone in front of the computer who can watch it from 11 to 7 or however your shelter hours work. Um, they must know the nursery population. They can't be saying yes, 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 and then we have no cages for them, or we don't have any feeders to feed them. So you need to make sure you're in constant um, you know, communication with your rescue coordinator, and that's where that EOD comes into my uh, comes into play. I have on there, and I think in the handouts, I have an example of my EOD. Um, I tell them, okay, I have 15 cages open. 
she knows she can pull 15 litters. Once she runs out of 15 is when she needs to contact me and say, hey, what do I need to do? Um, of course, this is when you're bigger. When you're smaller, you're going to have to be a little bit more picky about which litters you take. So then you would just tell your rescue manager, okay, ask them, you know, how long has this kitten been in your care? Um, have you noticed any, you know, signs of sickness, things like that? Um, so you might have to be a little bit more picky and a little bit more in contact. Foster manager, um, possibly paid. We have that because my foster manager was just started being paid last year. Um, the years before that, it's been a volunteer. This is a very, very stressful position. So let you know if you do have a volunteer who's doing this position, have a few of them because during June, July, sometimes they'll start feeling the burnout. Um, and then you don't want to be left with no foster manager in the middle of a busy season. So just keep that in mind. That's why we decided to have it a paid position. So that way we'll keep people a little bit more. They also have to know the, uh, the nursery population. They have to know the kittens too. They're matchmaking these guys, right, to foster. So they need to know, is this kitten a good eater? Um, how sick is this kitten? Does it need medical care, a medical foster, instead of a, um, just a brand new person who just filled out an application? And of course, you'll need to train them. Um, train them the way you want them to um, take care of the kittens. Uh, once you give them all the knowledge, you tell them exactly what to do, it's such a relief knowing that you did everything that you could. Um, you no second guessing yourselves, anything like that. Training coordinator, of course you need to train these new volunteers to come in, to feed the kittens, to um, keep them healthy. Uh, so you wanna make sure you have a great training program in place. Um, the best way you'll find with training is when you say the word bottle babies, everyone comes running, everyone wants to help and feed and play with them. Um, this is not a play, I mean, you don't play with them at all. You barely snuggle them when you have this many kittens. Um, they don't need snuggling. They need food, they need medicine, they need that. So um, we try to make sure that during our two hour training, we do like an orientation with people who are interested to weed out the ones who can't, who really don't want to weigh and don't want to stimulate and don't want to, um, you know, have to deal with fading kittens and things like that. Um, that will save on your training time. And then we do a training, uh, a shadow inside the nursery. So the new person is shadowing an experienced feeder. You don't want that new person with a brand new person because then they're both asking each other questions. So you want someone who's experienced who follows the rules. You don't ever want those people who are like taking pictures of kittens and saying, oh, I really shouldn't be doing that. Because if you tell that person, hey, you're not supposed to do it, but I'm doing it anyway, it kind of makes it sound a little lax, like we're not really that hardcore. So make sure you have somebody who's gonna follow the rules to the T if you're doing new shadows. That way that person doesn't think there's any way to, to um, go around the rules. And then um, of course they must be knowledgeable program policies and procedures. Keeping volunteers, I know um, it's hard. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to um, have a volunteer that has to go through the fading kitten protocol and then they're gone. Um, a lot of people feel guilt. Um, oh my goodness, you know, maybe it was my fault, things like that. Um, we've had a couple of accidents in the nursery. We've had cages left open and kittens have fell out and actually had, you know, brain issues. Um, we've had a little kitten actually getting a snuggle safe disc put on top of it. Um, things like that will happen. It's just the chaotic, you know, when you're not used to this age group, things like that, and just one slip. I mean, you have four kittens, you're trying to throw them back in the cage and they keep crawling out. Um, things like that happen. So you will lose volunteers, but the best way is just to keep trying to get it. Keep recruiting, even if you think you have your team, Keep getting it out there to have people coming in because you will go through a rotation. And life happens, right? Like people, you know, we have a, a mandatory weekly commitment. If somebody um, wants to, you know, go to Italy for the summer or something like that, you know, things like that happen, you gotta make sure you have enough people to cover it um, or you can't pull any more kittens. Um, show appreciation. We, Becky is our happy hour girl. She plans happy hours. I'm, once the season's going, as a manager, you're too busy. You really don't have time to take care of all the fun things. So it's very important to have like a volunteer liaison part of your team. Whoever's the most bubbliest out of your volunteer team and just say, hey, can you schedule a couple happy hours for the team? You know, 
once a month, every other month, things like that. So that way um, people can meet each other. Um, with the all in all out, it's kind of hard to meet other volunteers because you're in a room feeding with maybe one other person. So you don't get to see the other 99 people who are contributing to the, um, the program. Uh, so you want to make sure we educate. Every year we do um, workshops because we have a break. Our nursery shuts down usually around December, the beginning of December, and it doesn't open up again until April, into March, April. So during that downtime, we want to make sure that um, we have workshops for them to update any protocols or procedures. Um, that way everyone knows what's going on. Uh, everyone doesn't always check their email, so even though I send an email out, they may or may not read it. So we make sure they come in and they have to do a mandatory workshop to be refreshed. Uh, create standards, create team spirit, have fun. That's our bottle baby holiday party we have every year and it gets bigger every year. Raising money is a huge thing, of course. Um, here's some of the things that we just came up with. I'm one of those people that I hate it when I'm like, I need this. And they're like, nope, can't have it. We don't have the money for it. So. I'm like, all right, well, you need money, we'll, we'll figure out how to get money. So we have an annual baby shower every year. Usually it's around Mother's Day. Um, we do it then because around June and July, our nursery is packed, which means mm, not so, you know, smelly a little bit maybe and a little dirty sometimes. So we want to make sure it's at the beginning where there's kittens so they can come and actually see kittens and the feeders in action. And this is the only time the public is ever allowed in the nursery. And they are, uh, they are t uh, ha we have tour guides that take them in and actually go in one room only and show them how the room works, let them see how the feeders feed, how the boards are set up, and then they can actually go and look at the kittens too and see little baby kittens. No touching though, and you, that we do small groups of three to four so that way we can maintain them and make sure they don't stick those fingers in those cages. Um, but that's a great way to get supplies. Everyone wants, and it's a great family event too because they can bring their kids in there and stuff like that. You bring a paper towel and you get to go. And we do the, it where you bring a donation and you actually get a tour. So just because you show up, you don't get to go. You have to donate money or a supply to do it. Um, bottle baby calendars. Um, this is something fun for our fosters. Um, we have the fosters submit pictures um, for to be in the calendar and they have to be kittens from that year. Um, so the 2014 season we had all the fosters turn in submit their high-res photos. Um, we put it up on Facebook and we had a voting. Uh, we raised over $1,300 on the, just the voting alone. Um, people wanted their kittens to be in the calendar. People's mamas wanted their kittens in the calendar. People who adopted the kittens wanted it in the calendar. Um, so it's a really fun, easy way. We got the calendar sponsored through PostNet. They like charged us five dollars a calendar. We sold them for fifteen. Um, <clears throat> so and they're all pictures from Fosters. So that way we're bringing the Fosters into the program a little bit. Um, what has the voting there? We have T-shirts. We do once a year too. We have our volunteers uh, submit their drawings that they would like for a T-shirt. We vote on that as well. It's a dollar a vote, the same thing. Um, the money we raise is how we purchase the t-shirts. The same thing with the voting with the calendar. The money we raise is how we purchase the calendars. Um, the t-shirts, the uh, we had about five different drawings and then everyone votes on it. The one that raises the most money is the one we get. So this is the one we have. It says saving the world one kitten at a time. Um, and then sodas, we realized we don't have any vending machines on our property, so we decided that our volunteers would bring in sodas and we'd sell them a dollar a soda, um, mainly the staff and the volunteers and people that come in and we raise money that way. That way we can buy the Royal Cane and Kibble because it's so expensive we can't have it in our budget, but it works wonders. So we decided, okay, we'll make our own money to get it. So. Raising more money and a bigger, you know, grants. I'm sure if you guys have a grant writer, it's wonderful. That way you can get grants. I know we've gotten some from Maddie's Fund, and uh, it's been a huge help for KMR. That stuff is super expensive. Um, and in case if you guys are using KMR, I don't know about you, if you know about the redemption program. It's really awesome. Every KMR bag or can has points on the back. You save it, and you get free milk. Um, 180 points gets you a, uh, it says, 
it's a free bag basically, you pay $8 for shipping. But a five pound bag of KMR is normally 60 bucks and you get it for like $8 and something. All you have to do is snip the little points off the back of it. And if you're feeding, you know, we had 1,600 kittens, so we go through a lot of the milk and we were able to only, we only purchased four, four, four five pound bags last year. The rest of it was all free. Um, corporate sponsors. Uh, rich people, yay, we love rich people, don't we? So anytime you are in an event or something like that and somebody asks about your program, you make sure you tell them all about your needs as well, uh, how important it is, and, and let them know that no kill will not be here if it wasn't for this program. 1,600 kittens, 1,640 kittens would have been euthanized last season if it wasn't for this program alone. So that's a huge number, and we would not be able to be you know, no kill without it. <clears throat> and then of course always be alert, you know, hit up your friends. And then yes, so we're gonna take a little break really quick. And then um, afterwards, Rachel's gonna speak.